I'd like to draw your attention this morning to the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 10 and verse 40. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 10 and verse 40. Matthew 10, 40. Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. I should like you to look back over chapter 10. And I should like you to notice that Jesus spends much more time talking about the opposition and the persecution that will be faced in the world. He spends much more time warning those that he is about to send out and all of those who will follow him that even the members of their own household, even those who ought to love them the most, will despise them for the sake of Christ. He spends much more time talking about this than he does talking about the ones who will receive us. Because the way that leads to destruction is wide. And many travel that way. The path of salvation is narrow. Very few ever find it. In general, we are told to expect that the world will hate and despise us that they will make war against us. And we might expect, <clears throat> we might expect that though those who will be our allies are few, Jesus would want to spend more time talking about them in order to balance out this teaching and give us some kind of hope in our missional outreach, God's righteousness, walking endeavors. He might want to give us a greater assurance in the Christian life that it won't all be rejection and torture. He has already given us that assurance. Do not miss this point today that these last few verses of chapter 10 are not here to provide for us the counterbalance of what has preceded this brief discussion. These verses are not here to be our comfort in the midst of the trials and tribulations of the Christian life and the walk of a disciple and the ministry of the gospel. That assurance, that comfort, that rest has already come. And Jesus has directed us not to fellow human beings for such, but to God himself. Rightly is it sung afflicted saints to Christ draw near. For Christ is the sure and steady anchor. He will hold you fast. He is the God of all comfort, the God of all salvation, the God of all grace and mercy and steadfast love. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He is the sovereign one of his people who can do for us anything and everything that we might need. He is the one who is ever vigilant, washing over his flock and ready to tend to any sheep that should wander astray or that should be set upon by wolves or that should be in some way injured or sickly. It is he that we are to go to. And what he is what he is doing here is supplementary to that. What he is doing here is far more concerned with those who will encounter his disciple and who have opportunity to take them in and to give them encouragement and to give them refreshment and to be a help to them in some way. His focus is on those people. The disciples are to rest in him. 
He is the one who will stir up hearts to be allies. Do not lose sight of Christ's full sufficiency or his primacy, that he is your first and greatest recourse for relief in all of life. For if you come to these verses and you read from 40 to 42 and these three short verses, well, there are going to be some people who will take me in and I'm going to rely on those people. There will be times when you are disappointed because none of those people exist. There will be many times, the majority of times perhaps, that you will be disappointed because they will be a very small minority. If you put your trust in humans of any kind and not in God, then you will be disappointed. Because the one thing that we know about people to be abundantly true is that they always let you down. Let us pray. Father, we do let us, our brothers and sisters down. We let ourselves down. All flesh is weak, but you, Lord, are strong. Be strong in my weakness this morning to show your strength perfectly sufficient to all of your people and to all of those without the camp who you might draw in. Lord, if there are such, I pray that you would. I pray that you would turn hearts to your people and to yourself through the preaching of this word and get for yourself all glory for you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Whoever receives you, receives me. And whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. Let us focus then first on verse 41. Jesus here is talking to those people who are going to encounter his disciples, those who will have an opportunity to help them along the way. And he is encouraging them to help his people by promising them that there will be a reward for those who take in his people. Now this ought to intrigue everyone hearing this word this morning. This ought to intrigue everyone because we might in our lives have such opportunities as this. Perhaps we cannot go ourselves to deepest, darkest Africa. We are not called ourselves to go and to preach in various parts of this nation or to have some sort of proclamation ministry like these disciples are about to embark upon. But perhaps we can take one of them in for a time. Perhaps we can provide something for them so that they are able to continue their work and thereby get for ourselves a reward. And not just any reward, but the very reward that that person would receive for their ministry. Now think of what Jesus is saying here. Even if you are not a prophet, for only God can make a prophet. If you should take a prophet in, what reward shall you receive? He does not say you will receive the reward of one who took a prophet in. You will not receive the reward of a friend of a prophet. You will not receive the reward of a servant of a prophet. You will receive the reward of a prophet. If you should take in a righteous person, even if your own righteousness should be You do not receive the reward of one who takes in a righteous person or the friend of a righteous person. You receive the reward of a righteous person because you have done a righteous act. You have become part of the ministry that these people have. You have furthered their witness. And Jesus promises an abundant reward. So we ought all to be intrigued. So what is necessary to gain this reward? Point number one, you must have a right heart. He says, whoever takes in a prophet because he is a prophet. Now, if you have heard all of this about a reward and you are thinking, well, I'm going to find myself a prophet and I'm going to invite him over and I'm just going to love on that man 
until he can't even stand it. You'll get nothing. Because you haven't taken him in because he is a prophet. If you're taking a righteous person thinking, well, I'm going to get this reward of a righteous person, you're doing it for the wrong reason. Jesus promises this reward. But if you're thinking of a reward, then it doesn't really matter. The reward that you'll get, what is the reward of a prophet? What is the reward of a righteous person? It's not earthly wealth or the guarantee of earthly health. It's not prestige or popularity for sure. Look at how the prophets are treated. Perhaps it might be the kind of reward that, that widow got when she took in the prophet during the famine. I know she had both her own stomach and the stomach of her boy to feel, and now the stomach of this man, the prophet, also. And she had only a little flour and a little oil. And the whole time that the famine went on and the prophet was there, her supply never failed. God always gave her enough, not just for his servant, the prophet, but for this woman and her child as well. I think most you ought to look for a reward in heaven. You ought to look for the glory of God first. You're to take in these people because they're God's people. You ought to show them favor because they are God's servants. You are to help them because they are doing God's work. You are to do what you can for them because it is for the glory of God. Do not miss it this morning. The right motivation is critical in all of this. If your motivation is wrong, you will not be a good host to these men. And you will be disappointed with what you receive after. Point number one, your heart must be right. Point number two in verse 42, and whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Say, Pastor, I can't do very much. It doesn't matter. Even a cup of water is rewarded. The smallest gesture of kindness, the smallest show of encouragement, the smallest thing that you are able to do, the simplest thing you are able to do, if done with a right heart, for the right reason, to the right person, still gains you a reward. And it is a reward that cannot be lost. Because the reward is not up to that man. It does not... He does not go on to instruct these, these men that you are to repay them. If they give you a cup of water, give them a jug of water in return. If they let you stay at their house for five nights, let them stay at your house for ten. See, some of these guys don't even have a house. Jesus didn't. No, your reward is secure because it is Christ who will reward you. Your reward is disproportionately large because it is the very generous Lord Jesus Christ who shall reward you out of his endless, limitless, bottomless treasury. Even the smallest thing that you can do ought not to be despised and ought not to be withheld, for even that is something to be esteemed and appreciated. And believe me, God's servants will appreciate it. They might not know how to let you know that they appreciate it. It might not always show in the midst of the ministry. But even if it is lacking in a disciple or a righteous person or a prophet, it is still there. It is remarkable, is it not, when we have been told so much about those who will hate the disciples because of Christ, 
when we are reminded that they mistreated and persecuted the prophets because they brought God's word, when we are so many times told that the righteous are despised for their righteousness because they shine a light of clarity into the life of sinners and force them to grapple with their own depravity and to face the reality that they have no righteousness of their own and they are in desperate need of God. And so they must go to him and bow before him, humbling them themselves and denouncing their self-reliance and becoming fully reliant on the grace of Jesus Christ, believing that that alone is sufficient for them, that all that God has said is true and good and right, and living in accordance with that confession and profession. The world has never liked the gospel, so why should it like the people that bring it? The wonder is that there are any people who would welcome in these men. They're preaching an unpopular message. They're tied to a controversial man. Their work is not glamorous or glorious unless you view it from an eternal perspective, which is admittedly hard to do, even if you're the one ministering. And these men had been on the road. They were rough, dirty men. They didn't have a great appearance. We are told, even of Jesus, their master, that he had no appearance that we should esteem him as anything other than stricken, smitten, and afflicted. It is a wonder that there are allies to the gospel ministry, and yet we are told they are. And if this was all that we were told, it would be enough. It would be enough incentive for some to partner with us would be enough for us to praise the gracious kindness of our Lord in stirring up some heart to help us along the way. But the greatest wonder of these verses comes in verse 40, right at the beginning. Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Jesus says in no uncertain terms, when you take in one of his disciples, when you take in one of his ministers, you're taking him in. When you do the least little thing for one of his people, it's like you do it for him because he is there in the person of the Holy Spirit. And where the Holy Spirit is, there is the, spirit, there is the presence of the Son and there is the presence of the Father going with their people. What a wondrous Lord we serve. He is a highly exalted ruler, a King of kings and a Lord of lords. And if he had written in this verse, whoever receives one of these receives my servant, and I will reward him accordingly, that would have been enough. If he had have said, anyone who receives one of these receives my friend, and I will reward him accordingly, it would have been enough. If he had said, anyone who receives one of these receives my brother or my sister, that would have been enough. But he does not say any of these things. He says, whoever receives one of these receives me myself, and I shall reward you accordingly. So strongly does our Lord identify with his people. So firmly is he bound to us. So deeply does he love and care for us that he shall identify himself with us this closely. We have no head in this church that has been shevered from the body and become numb to its wants and its pains and its comforts. 
We serve a Lord who is intimately connected to every member of the body and knows everything that is done to you and is keeping watch over all of it and keeping account of all of it to reward those who have been kind to us and and turn to Acts 9 quickly and see the flip side of this most excellent teaching. Saul of Tarsus persecutes Christians. He persecutes them indiscriminately. He persecutes them great and small. He nearly wipes out the church in Jerusalem. And then he is confronted by the awesome presence, the Lord Jesus Christ. His progress in murder completely arrested. And as the Lord confronts him, he does not say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my servant? He does not say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my friends? Or why are you persecuting my people? Or why are you persecuting my sons and daughters or my brothers and sisters? He says, why are you persecuting me? There is no harm inflicted upon God's people that he does not take personally. The insult that you offer to one ordained of God is offered to God himself. What you say about his body and his bride, he hears all of it. Do not think that you can sit behind closed doors and mock God's people with impunity. Do not think that you can mistreat one of God's own and you will not suffer for it at the proper time. For those of us who are here in Christ, we must also be careful of these things. We must be careful firstly that we do not forget who we are and who indwells us. We must remember so that we do not think to ourselves, let me remember this offense that was offered me and seek to take vengeance for myself. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And we ought to believe it. For he knows it well and he cares deeply. He identifies with us strongly. So strongly it is right that we should say what so many of the martyrs had said from the very first. Even what our Lord said upon the cross to all of us, for all of us. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Friends, so many of them don't. And frankly, so many of us don't. For if we really believed it, we would not act as we often do. We must remember firstly who we are in this and who it is that has taken ownership of us and adopted us and called us brothers and sisters, heirs of the kingdom, members of the body. But also, beloved, and especially you who are not of Christ, be very, very careful in what you say, and what you think, and how you act toward believers, whether they be fellow believers to you or just believers. For what you do to them, you do to Christ. Give thought. Give thought to how you might come alongside the ordained men and the called women God puts in your path. Take thought to how you might help them along the way. I do not say these things for my own benefit. I say them for yours. Just as in this instruction, the Lord does not speak to his disciples and say, this will be to your benefit, but he speaks to those who have the opportunity to come alongside them. And he speaks about their reward, their benefit. Beloved, I would have you to lose nothing of your benefit, nothing of what you might obtain from Christ. For in a day of glory, 
You will not regret those things you gave up on earth to gain the imperishable things of heaven. You will not lament that you sacrificed some here so as to have more to lay at the feet of your Lord and Savior there. And I think that we will all regret mightily the things that we spoke against God's people because there we shall not fail to know that we spoke them against God. Let me pray for you. Father, may all of us, your people, know that you are not afar off from us. You are not numb to our condition. That you care whether people treat us well or poorly. You care what is said about us. You keep a record of it. Those who are good to us are good to you. And they will receive an award, a reward that exceeds all that they had done. That those who come against your body come against you and you will avenge. Let us not think that the voice of the martyrs that cries out in heaven before the throne even now shall not one day be answered. Let us think that you will fail to judge rightly and justly. But let us have the same heart that you had in all that we do towards your people, and towards those without who are still under the damnation of sin, show all of them the mercy that you showed us. Show all of them the love that you first showed us. Show them the kindness that you show us in every passing moment. Lord, I pray all of these things that you might be greatly glorified. I ask them all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are without Christ, you're working for a Lord that cares nothing about you. He doesn't identify with you at all. You're entirely beneath him. He doesn't care what people do to you. He doesn't care what happens to you. He will use you up and spit you out and laugh as you go on to hell. But you have this day the opportunity to serve a Lord who cares deeply, even for the least of all of his servants, that he notes even the least kindness that is done to one of them and rewards it generously. Those of you who are in Christ already, your Lord is so good. He cares for you so much. Seek for grace to serve him better. For he is worthy of our very best service. Whatever he has laid on your heart, do it now. While today is still today, we don't know that we're going to walk out that door in a few minutes. When you meet your Lord, you want to be able to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You want to know that you really were. Won't you come even as we sing?